So um, the next speaker is Martin Odia. He is an MBA and a businessman, a published author, and the current CEO of the Longevity Events Limited, which uh, holds the annual Longevity Summit in uh, uh, Dublin, as uh, Aubrey already uh, mentioned earlier. So Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you. And the screen is sharing okay and everything? Yes. Okay, so thanks uh, Didier and Sven and team um, for the invitation and for running the event. Um, I, had, I think I have six minutes, so I better go real quick. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I just want to, to take a, a step back, take a, a kind of a broad perspective on the field, what we're doing, the frustrations around it, and maybe some suggestions as to how we might accelerate process, progress. Um, and it's a rather provocative title, but it's not, you know, for, for Jose's benefit, it's not that I'm shouting Viva la Revolution here um, necessarily. It's just to look at, at some limits regarding the market economy model that we currently have and maybe shifts in focus towards other um, methods of, of working together and collaborating. Um, so let me just change the screen. Yeah, so the, the idea, as I've, I've said, is to look at um, potential for collaborative models and also the role of not-for-profits um, in, in accelerating this the, the fight we have against diseases <clears throat> and maybe looking as well at, you know, the, the idea that we, we haven't done an amazing job through the market, uh, market economics model. And I would just say that when we're talking about market economics and the, the capitalist system, um, although not Viva la Revolution necessarily, we, we should kind of keep in mind that this is a, a model, a construct that's inherited from, you know, the aristocratic uh, society of the Industrial Revolution. So while useful, certainly in some circumstances, it should be like everything else. It should be open to uh, challenge, amending, changing, modifying, um, particularly in an era of such advanced technology where uh, the limits of companies um, might uh, cause strain. So I think, um, you know, we've all, we're all familiar with the idea of 110,000 people dying each day from aging. Um, and we should pause on the, the morality of that, I think, uh, because it is a pretty horrendous uh, thing. And also even that gets us off a little bit. 110,000 people die every day is like a one-off event. But the reality is, of course, for the vast majority of those, the preceding 10 years has been unpleasant. The preceding year has been pretty horrendous with maybe dementia and incontinence and immobility and fragility and all these other things going on. It's a really, really unpleasant process. So we have that moral side when we're trying to advocate and, and reorient our efforts. Um, we also don't have a huge financial impetus to, to, make, uh, to make gains in this field an enormous um, financial incentive. So as a society, I think the point to make is that the financial incentive is there, but how does that transfer across then into specific uh, companies and how we organize things currently? So um, <clears throat> there's a funding mismatch. Uh, the, the research into the biology of aging is less than 1%. The research uh, that goes into the chronic diseases and interventions. Now, that does make sense when you look at the previous slide, because we we still frame this as the cost of the different diseases. And then we add it all together rather than saying the cost of aging, which is the precursor to all those diseases. Obviously, Aubrey's on the call and has been shouting about this for 20 years. Um, uh, and it's getting there. The, the landscape is certainly changing, um, but there's still an awful long way to go um, from trying to hammer that message home that you know, we shouldn't be so kind of unbalanced in, in our investment and our research efforts. Okay, um, I was thinking of an analogy to this. So uh, a town near where I grew up, every year in the 80s, they had a flood, like almost religiously every year. Um, and they put down sandbags at the, the doors of the houses and the shops. And every year the floods came in and every year, you know, a lot of damage was done and it cost a lot of money and, and, and so on. And then at some point, somebody went two or three miles up river and widened the bed of the river and they haven't had a flood since. And <clears throat> this notion 
are going upstream rather than you know firefighting or trying to send back the, the the floods uh is something that we really have to try to find ways in our ad advocacy to hammer home um it's difficult it's challenging it's a change in paradigm but um you know it's something that we really should uh spend more and more time explaining that it, what we're trying to do is widen the riverbed and not just put the sandbags down when the floods come of the different diseases um okay so i wasn't wanted to identify the core problems as i see them at the moment um or at least some of them um but i will concentrate on on number three and number four so co coalescing around an, an agreed aging clock um to measure the impact is something that i think a lot of people have discussed in in recent times um there are many clocks uh they are kind of evolving all the time but there is an argument to be said that we just need to collectively with the leading scientists, uh, many of whom are on the call, collectively decide upon a clock or a series of clocks and say, this is the measurement method we're going to use and then bring that to regulators. Um, and that this might in some way allow us to measure that that we're trying to intervene with. The second one is the regulatory impasse around the holistic decline of aging as a disease. Yeah, and we have, plenty of conversation about that already and the great work done by Daria <clears throat> and others um but yeah at the moment people who are who are researching interventions interventions in aging are still probably going to put it under the label of Parkinson's or something like that and try to run it through uh, a, a trial um the lack of incentives across the players involved is one of the two things I want to look at for the rest of this talk um and, and also the, the need to imagine different models because just of the sheer complexity of the task that we're undertaking. So um, just for a moment, I'm going to imagine a world, so a thought experiment. Let's say we did, uh, we did realize the magnitude of this, the inordinate suffering, the, the huge loss of, of life and um, intelligence and wisdom and experience. Um, and the, the continuation of this. And we, we decided as a, as a globe, okay, we're actually gonna concentrate on this and nothing else. So for the fun, the, the purpose of this thought experiment is to push the limits of what we could do. So theoretically, we could get you know, all the adults in the world to agree. Uh, let's keep some of them you know, for ambulances and stuff like that. But you know, generally, let's get them to work on aging. Let's use the ridiculous volume of computational capacity that we have, the huge data centers, the constantly evolving AI to, to screen molecules, to assess different species, to do all of those wonderful things that we could do. Imagine if we could do it, you know, hundreds of thousands of times the level that we're doing now. Give the right people lab access, give, make sure that there is no financial limitation here or there's no shareholder imperative. It is just a goal of resolving aging, and that's the only goal we have. So that's the nirvana type world. Um, and it would be an interesting question to ask the scientists on, on, on the call or elsewhere, like in that scenario, and I, I know it's only an estimate, but how long does it take to get to a point where you reach longevity escape velocity? If you really could harness all the resources in the world. Obviously, <clears throat> we have nothing like that. Um, and if we look at what we are doing now, in some ways, it's great. And in some ways, it's disappointing. It, you know, are you half class or half full kind of person? So yeah, repurpose drugs, um, lifestyle and, and supplementation, calorie restriction mimetics, um, which I know, you know, is kind of repetitive, but I liked that little icon particularly, um, and longevity clinics. Uh, so these have impacts and this isn't to say that these are bad things or these are unnecessary or unwelcomed the reality is that lots of people go to conferences all year and have meetings and, and discussions around how to design better weapons to kill each other so i wouldn't you know suggest that people working in these areas are doing anything other than really stellar and important work um, and it is work that will help us to get to a point where we can get to the other points um, but it will only get you so far, obviously, and there are limitations to what you can achieve by focusing on these areas. 
and realistically a huge amount of the money that is being spent now is being spent within this kind of slides um you know contents so why is that well i would argue that it's the profit motive and it's the focus on profit that is sort of you know ingrained in the systems that we use so I, I, the point that's being made in this slide is yeah we focus mostly on low-hanging fruit we get that <clears throat> we can by the growing awareness of the field we can widen the focus a little bit and we can get synalytics and so on funded to a point where they go to trial but um the really really challenging stuff uh still isn't getting a whole lot of of investment um and you know, that's the nature of the beast of a firm that has shareholders that are looking for a return. Um, they are, they almost have to. You, if you if you look through the details of the corporate governance and all of that stuff, you'll see that there is there really is no escaping the imperative to chase profit. It's almost impossible to take a really long term perspective or to take a a, a loss making perspective for a higher goal or higher um, aspiration. So it, it's kind of, um, it's it can be morally perplexing, but it's logically unavoidable that this is where the focus will be on the low hanging fruit, on the things that are relatively easy to prove and show and, and work on. Okay, so just to, to kind of keep it moving then, um, I guess one of the points I wanted to make was that, you know, as everyone here is aware, this is an incredibly complicated uh, task that's being undertaken. Um, and yeah, the, like <clears throat> even the idea of a company, the size and scale of Google and their, their Calico or Alphabet's uh, subsidiary Calico, with the billions of dollars that they have, do we really think that inside the four walls of any one organization, we're going to be able to tackle something as immensely complex as um, aging. Um, and I would argue that that seems highly unlikely, that the, the necessity to share information and to build on other people's work and, and, and to avoid duplication as well, to avoid, you know, Spin running one experiment for a year and Didier running the same experiment for a year. That's a wasted year. You know, if they talk to each other at the beginning and they represent two companies, then they can work on two different areas and find, you know, some intelligent ways to deal with IP. IP will will remain, I guess, a fact of life. But yes, it is a, an extraordinarily complex um, task that we're trying to to take take on. Um, and I think as well, <clears throat> for what it's worth, I, I was listening to. Um, Yao yesterday talking about, you know, the interventions having an impact, maybe they're only addressing diseases and maybe they're not, you know, um, the, the impact they're having on, on lifespan is just as a result of addressing the diseases rather than the actual decline and the deterioration that happens across time. Um, and to me, uh, it feels, and again, this is an, a non-scientific perspective, but it, it feels a bit like spinning plates. So um, you have a series of plates spinning, and to be honest, once one or two of those plates fall, it's kind of the whole system falls apart a little bit. Um, and so it would seem to me that the only way you get serious uh, impact on lifespan and on the health span even um and i mean you know serious substantial impact the only way you do that is by keeping all of the plates spinning or, or nearly all of the plates spinning um and that requires an enormous investment no not to be just kind of promoting what LAVA is doing but the, the major mass rejuvenation where you're doing multiple interventions concurrently and comparing those with, you know, controls and so on. That to me, just in my simple interpretation, but that's the only thing that really makes sense. But that's expensive. It's big, it's challenging. Uh, it will require for us to get to the point where we, we have success. I'm sure there'll be plenty of failures. There'll be plenty of things that cancel each other out or, or cause trouble. 
etc but if we're to actually intervene in aging if we're to actually you know substantially uh, increase lifespan yes we can do all of the things on supplements and diets and, and repurpose drugs and everything else like that and even the stages in between but ultimately we, we're going to have to do multiple interventions at the same time and to do this we require uh, you know a really substantial amount of money um and so i talked about the freedom of not for profits and the freedom there is to pursue a mission without having the shareholder over your shoulder requiring a return um no i think any model of collaboration actually is really useful um and it was interesting to hear about vita though um and yeah i i, I think that the, all of those kind of decentralized collaborative models um are to be encouraged and are great and everything i i wonder what happens when they get to a point where they need to uh bring on other investors to take on bigger tasks now maybe they can they can circumvent that i'm not i'm not 100 sure but at some point the same issues may rear their heads again so i think we need to find we need to invest heavily in in not-for-profits and it doesn't have to be lev only it can be others as well but we need to invest heavily in those we need to make sure their missions are pure um, and then we need to take on the high hanging fruit, you know, the top of that tree, because we're all getting older. We're running out of time here. Um, and, and in some ways, we're, we're kind of it feels like we're just, you know, kind of tinkling around the edges rather than actually getting to the core of us. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't have a whole lot uh, more to add. Um, it, it, it can be uh, something I think when, with, with the collaboration that allows for um, like an open collaboration of data. So I know Didier is going to speak about this. I think there's a healthy data, healthy data, healthy data space or something, health data space or something like this in Europe at the moment. And it's interesting to see that you know the pharmaceutical companies are are mad to get access to patients' data, but they have little interest in sharing data. So to finish off my talk, I was just going to say that for, not for profits can support for profits by example and by leadership. Um, and that's definitely something that can happen. You can show the, the if you show them the multiple interventions work to some degree, then they will follow suit and they will change their, their trajectory. Um, but I think another thing that maybe we can do that, that combines advocacy with the idea of, um, you know, challenging the for profit system the only thing i've seen in my lifetime that, that has worked here is what's called csr or corporate social responsibility now it doesn't buck the whole system but it definitely has an impact so if you go to the 70s economists would have argued companies only responsibility this is a very famous expression it's only responsibilities to its shareholders and they would have said at the time like of course who else are they responsible to they own the company and they would have further argued that a company should only compete really hard with other companies. And overall for society that benefited because it bought down the price and increased the quality of, of products and services. So that was all fine. These people would say that a company giving money to charity or to any other social cause was ridiculous. They would have argued that other people in society should do that. And the companies should just focus on competition and on reducing their prices and improving their no. That argument held water right up until the 80s and maybe even the 90s. And then that argument lost out basically to this notion of CSR, corporate social responsibility. And that has many different guises. But ultimately what it is, is the public pressurizing companies by even the threat of their euro or their dollar going elsewhere. If they don't take certain um, moral decisions or if they don't at least be seen to be taking those decisions. So... I'm not 100% sure how we might frame this, but um, to, to, to look at what Didier is talking about and to look at the idea of sharing data, if there's some really simplistic encapsulation of how we can get anyone in the health sector, anyone definitely in digital health, because there's so much information available, it's being tracked on your watch all day, every day. If we can force the for-profit sector to share as much of that as possible under a type of CSR 
pressure, then I think that might be beneficial because researchers around the world would love to get access to this data. And I know some data will need to stay behind IP, and I, I get that. But I think we can definitely pressurize companies by explaining to the public, look, this is, and this can be health rather than longevity specific, but explaining to the public that this is hugely beneficial. If these companies do this, uh, it doesn't cost them much or anything, and it will help other researchers, other scientists to, to, to take forward other treatments. Um, but to do that, companies need to sign up to whatever we decide to call this notion of uh, data sharing and health data sharing um, that the CSR machine turns on. Um, okay, that's it. Um, thanks again to the organizers. Okay, uh, thank you, Martin, uh, for this uh, lecture. Um, I see there is some questions out there. Um, Leon uh, asks, so how do we break the spell of entrepreneurship and uh, venture capital incentivize, incentivizing everyone to repackage bad science into business plans and longevity products? Yeah, I suppose that's the, that's the question I was asking through, through the whole um, talk as well. Uh, I think not-for-profits do help an awful lot. I think um, I think things like Vita Da and so on show uh, the desire to reimagine um, how we go about this. And, and generally, the incentives in this industry are a hell of a lot better than the incentives in other industries. Oh, sorry, not the, the motivations, um, but it's extremely difficult. That's the system we're immersed in, um, and it's it's really really difficult to avoid the the profit motive. Uh, and Walter asks, not-for-profits often patent their useful findings, for example, the Sense Foundation, holding it back from general accessibility. How do you beat that? Well, I mean, I would have thought that the idea of a not-for-profit is that you work towards a mission um, and that you don't necessarily compromise that mission. Can other organizations, you know, I, like I would think that if, if the LEVF Foundation makes a, a discovery or a, a, an advantage. There will be companies that will come from that. Um, that's what's already happened with since I guess in Aubrey's work is things were you know worked on fifteen years ago and they are now you know the centers of of industries that we have. So there is a natural progression from not for profit into for profit, but um, the not for profits I guess should be dedicated to the mission. Okay. Yeah. Aubrey uh, has uh, maybe a question or wants to respond. Yeah, I will respond um, because, I mean, Walter makes a very good point, um, but certainly um, an organization like Sense Research Foundation or LEV Foundation, because we are working on quite uh, on really very early stage research, it means that the uh, profit motive is rather different than it would be for a nonprofit working at, on, at, at the clinical level, for example, where something is quite close to actual revenue. The difference really is that um, neither SRF nor LV LEVF would see ourselves as uh, aiming to mainly obtain our revenue from um, you know, royalties or whatever on things that somebody else is selling, uh, it's simply because that would be too far in the future. And therefore, we would tend, yes, we would have the, have the IP, but that would be not for our benefit, but for the benefit of those who would take that IP forward through the commercialization stages, through the later stages. And I mean, so when we would spin out um, startup companies from SRF, um, we would always take only a very modest equity position so as not to dilute other investors and so to maximally incentivize people to do that. And the same, the, same impli the same applies to sharing of information in general. So, you know, I sign NDAs left, right and center, and I encourage other people to do the same precisely in order to ensure that the information is locked up as little as possible. Okay. Yes, uh, one of the problems is, of course, that if you don't patent something, then typically things just stay in academia and don't move forward because uh, no company is interested in something that is, isn't patented and cannot result in any profit. 